<laughs> okay, so hello everyone. Today's um, astrology conversation is about this incredible lunar eclipse that's happening tomorrow. Um, that's going to be the main bulk of the conversation. Um, but I actually felt I just wanted to give you a quick rundown as well on how to find your Venus star point. Um, because we're at this really amazing part of Venus's journey where she's resurrecting. And she um, will see that she's all part of this eclipse tomorrow. And uh, so for any of you who haven't done your Venus star point, um, it's really interesting. Like I did mine, Phoebe showed me how to do it years ago, and we're born a number of years apart, and we have the same Venus star point in um, Aquarius. So uh, it can be quite interesting and revealing. Um, so my first share, I'm just going to show you this website. And um, if you don't know your Venus star point, you could put your date of birth in the thing and we'll have a look at it. We'll work it out right now. OK, so here we go. So um, you can go on this website anytime. It's called sophiavenus.com. Um, and what we're going to do is look at someone's um, date of birth. So let's do mine first of all. If I can't see the chat at the moment, apart from anything else. So I was born on the 10th of September, 1970. So what we're doing is we're looking for the Venus star point i.e. The, when Venus was conjunct the sun, the time before we were born, like the last time. So if I'm born September 1970, mine is this one here, January 24th, 1970, at four degrees Aquarius. So that is my Venus star point. Now, what you can do as well is in your birth chart, or you can just make a five-pointed star. So my head point is four degrees Aquarius. And then um, you go back to, so my other star points would be 18 Aries, 29 Gemini. And then you go forward to 17 Scorpio, three um, <clears throat> Virgo. So um, those make up my five, if you imagine that sort of Michelangelo. Um, it's good to do, do it on the Zodiac, actually, on if you have your birth chart, because, you know, just make a star where they are, because then you can see which ones are the arms and the legs. Um, more clever people than me might just be able to tell you that, but I haven't got the sort of spatial awareness to do that um okay so allison do you have an change okay if I'm, if, if I'm december 1971 would i would my star point be august 27th then yes okay if you could talk to me actually because i can't see the chat at the moment um so yeah laurie yours would be this august 27th 1971 so three Virgo, and then um, we're kind of crossing over. So you've got 17 Scorpio. Now bear in mind, that's where the eclipse is. So that's gonna be a very powerful point. And four Aquarius is your two other ones. And then 26 Gemini, 19 Aries. Okay, so anyone else's date of birth you wanna give me? Um, December 2nd, 74. So it looks like. Yeah, it's this one here. So November 6, 1974. Nice time, 8.08 a.m. 13 Scorpio, 44. So that's your head one. Um, so 
So also very close to the eclipse point. Um, and then you have three Aquarius, 19 Aries, three Virgo, 27 Gemini. So you can see these points are pretty close together as well as they move around the zodiac. Um, Thank you. Okay, next. Alice and Sasha. Oh, sorry, Kristen, go ahead. No, nope. you go ahead, Sasha, go ahead. Okay, um, yeah. January 4th, 64. Okay, so January 4th, 64. So it's going to be this one. It's actually going to be August 29th, 1963. And it's five Virgo, 58 minutes. So far, everyone has been evening star as well. Um, so if it falls on a retrograde, that means it's morning star. And if it falls on direct, that means it's evening star, basically. Okay. I'm right about. I'm right above Sasha, so um, September 28th, 1962. So would that be yeah, January? January 27th, 1962. So you seven Aquarius, mm -hmm. zero. Interesting, because seven is a prominent number in your profile, isn't it? Yeah, I have it twice. Yeah, so exactly mm -hmm. degrees, like no minutes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah so just um they're good to mark on your chart you know so you know when things are going on there even though it looks like you might not be having a transit it might be actually activating your venus star point so if we've done everyone then i think we are we? no mine is um 6th of may 1969 allison Ah, 6th of May. Ah, so it's this one. This is quite close to it. So it's April the 8th, 1969 at 10, 10 a.m. And it's 18 Aries, 36 minutes retrograde. So you're a morning star, um, which is more of a warrior energy of, of Venus in the morning star. Okay. So, hee -hee. so all armed with our Venus star points now. Um, interesting, a couple of you, it's, it's actually going to show in this lunar eclipse. Um, so just to say something on the basics of a lunar eclipse, what that means in astrology is firstly, the lunar side is going to access the subconscious. And then the um, eclipse side, even more so. Um, and I really realized the power of this when I was doing sailing, because um, Cynthia, you'll know this, that when you get eclipses, um, you see the rise in the tide and the fall in the tide is much more extreme. Mm -hmm. It happens actually three days afterwards. It might not be tomorrow. You know, you might be looking Thursday and Friday when you actually get this peak experience. And how I imagine it is it's like dragging things out of our water body you know, memories, um, somatic experiences. Um, so it can be very powerful and, and it is about things coming up from the subconscious. So I guess the thing is not to be alarmed. <laughs> so I mean, it's, ah, you know, but to go, okay, this is an opportunity to see this. Um, and uh, yeah, and I've I've really been having it really powerfully and a very powerful experience the last few days of seeing like some really dark entrenched patterns. Um, but to just kind of look at them and think it doesn't matter that they're happening in a way. It's just our ability to see them and be with them and let that kind of wave pass of 
discomfort or fear or whatever's going on. So we're going to look at two charts. We'll look at the astrology chart first, so you can kind of see what, how that all looks. And then we'll look at the, um, the human design side as well, which shows us sort of different things. Um, and, you know, human design, I'm not an expert on it um, by any means. So please feel free. And with the astrology, actually, if you notice something, I haven't noticed, then point it out. Okay, so this is an almighty, um, this is a, such a powerful um, thing going on, really, at the moment. Um, I'll manage to hide it and close that. Okay, so here's the moon. So when we have a full moon, um, the moon is opposite the sun. So what I've done is the um, eclipse chart. So the full moon is actually at 16 degrees and the moon has moved slightly on when we start getting the eclipse. Um, so that's, you know, when it's exact full moon, the, the moon would be at 16 degrees there. So you can see that the moon is exactly conjunct Uranus, and this is in Jinki 2, um, in, in the sign of Taurus. So it's a very powerful as well, because Uranus is like the revolutionary planet. It can turn everything upside down. And that's actually what's happened to me in the last like 24 hours like all my plans have been turned upside down well not all of them but one important one um and so this can happen right now so if we look at the shadow is dislocation um and for me you know I immigrated from South Africa to England when I was 18 and I had a profound sense of dislocation for many, many years. So dislocation for me is really connected to the land that you live on. Um, and we've got this Taurus energy as well. So if you feel like you don't belong on the land where you live, or you don't belong in the community where you live, this is what I feel most describes a feeling of dislocation. But, you know, other people may have other types of experiences of that. Um, and it's moving towards orientation. So this is why I'm saying, you know, you, overnight you may be reorientated in a completely different and shocking, because Uranus is a shocking planet direction, and it's towards the north node. So it's like if you are kind of out of alignment with your cosmic destiny, this may be a time where things kind of go and kind of project you in that direction. So now let's look at the other side here. So this is where the sun is and the south node. And look at this. We've got exact... Um, Mercury sun conjunction. So like Venus, Mercury goes through the similar process of morning star, evening star, and these points where they meet exactly are very powerful, like they're Mercury star points, I guess. And this is happening in Jinki 1, which is the pure Yang codon, and it's about... Um, the shadow is entropy, this kind of downward spiral of life. And then it comes up into freshness and beauty. So how do we create the new forms? How do we allow, allow life to be like undulating and constantly refreshing itself? You know, one thing I'm learning so much is when we try and pin things down too much, we sort of prevent that freshness from being able to operate. Um, so very much is 
indicate new beginnings as well. So all of you with the Venus star point, um, I think it was, I know Tara, and I think Laurie had it here in, in this area. It's going to be really activated. And you can see Venus from her star point. She's only moved on four degrees. And she's in Gene Key 43, which is that shadow of deafness. Um, so what is it that you're not listening to um, that can, you know, solve a lot of things at this moment in time, just like that deep listening? OK, so another powerful thing is, this, is that Mercury and the sun are squaring um, Saturn there. So this is about when things square Saturn, Saturn's the planet of you know, it feels like we something's stopping us, something stands away, maybe doors shut in our face, you know, maybe things that were available to us are suddenly no longer available. Um, and that can be how we enter the reorientation because a path that was previously available is no longer available. Um, we also have, if you look at the blue lines on the chart, we have this grand trine in water um, between Venus and, and all of this part of the eclipse. We have Pallas Athena there in Cancer, the warrior goddess, and we have Neptune and Jupiter there in Pisces. So a grand trine in water is about emotional intelligence arising. Um, and one thing I was just talking about to Kristen is I've had this situation the last few days, or well, the last day, where I've had to really say like no to old patterns very strongly um, in a difficult situation because you know, a friend of mine I was going to move in with is really unwell with post-traumatic stress disorder and his house is like just crazy. He's been hoarding stuff for like the last 10 years. And and I just had to say, no, I, I can't come and live with you, which was quite hard. But, um, you know, it's the emotional intelligence in me is like, you cannot do this, you know. So, so, so look at that, you know, what is your emotional intelligence guiding you to do in this moment and guiding you to clear from your fractal? You know, you may be asked to say strong yeses or no's to things that are kind of creating um, corruption in your fractal lines. That's kind of how I experienced today, like a big spring clean of my fractal line happened. Um, yes, yeah, so the, the, the final thing I'm going to point out, I could go on this chart all day, but um, is this here. So this is Juno and Astraea here in the eighth house in Pisces. And they're both at eight degrees Pisces in the eighth house. Um, that's in London. Um, so these two have been together since the last eclipse and the Venus star point. And they're really supporting, um, you know, Estrella is the goddess of the new golden age. She's bringing in this heightened awareness, this more subtle awareness and awakening so she's traveling in this powerful combination with juno so this awareness is awakening in the field of our relationships um whether that's our inner feminine masculine whether that's with our uh, with men outside ourselves um, but it's it's a really beautiful thing of supporting you know, this new Venus star point in Libra um, and super sensitive in the sign of Pisces. 
Um, so we might find like our psychic awareness is really increasing as well at the moment. Okay, so does anyone want to say anything on the astrology bit? Want to add anything that you feel or see or anything going on with you that's reorientating you or, you know, the masculine feminine thing? I have a question um, on the grand trine in water. So we have Pallas Athena and Cancer and Neptune and Juniper and Pisces. And then what's the third? Is that the sun in uh, Scorpio? Or no, the sun in. Yeah, yeah. So the sun is 16, Mercury 16. So the more exact one is Venus at 20 degrees in Scorpio. Okay. Yeah, but really the whole eclipse and Venus. Yeah. Mercury is kind of being embodied in that seed there. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's quite a few there that that have been playing out in my in my life the last week. I've had family over to stay, and I have the forty three. It's my core where Venus is in, and I noticed not what I'm deaf to. It's who's deaf to me, right? So in the new way of speaking, who's not able to understand or hear what it is that you're trying to say? And so I sat, even though I had a house full, I sat in a lot of silence because I realized that me speaking was getting nowhere for me. And so I would just listen and then not maybe respond to the old patterns that were playing out I would just let the silence sit there and then that silence made the other uncomfortable and then they came around a bit so that was one with the 43 and then obviously my life's work is the two and my evolution is the one because I have the sphinx and I'm finding that there isn't the entropy this time I don't have that I'm be I've become very creative in the last few days it's almost and at night time like at two o'clock in the morning I'm out looking at the stars and the moon is so full and beautiful and bright um, and I've had so many ideas that I'm writing them down and I was even doing artwork today which I would never do I'm not an artist in any way as if any of you've seen my pictures they're very childlike but it's like that creative spark has really just picked itself up very beautifully um, and I know that the numbness could is there underneath but it's not as prominent as it would be um, and then the reorientation is me speaking when I need to not speaking when I when I feel that it's not going to be received I reorientate the conversation onto some, something else so all of that has been playing out quite quite nicely actually in my life over the last week with old patterns so thank you for that for highlighting that yeah lovely And in the Delta game, Cynthia, what position are you in? I'm not what in position? the Delta game. I'm not in oh. it yet. Yeah, oh, we're, the, th we're oh. the third one. I'm waiting. Okay. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm waiting. Very, very soon, actually. I think we're nearly together with the third. We've had a fourth person join today, Lorna. And Kristen's got three friends, so we might be ready to go soon. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah there's I was just a... say the entropy pattern is I feel mm -hmm. I was confronted with with my friend you know he was he had a very traumatic thing happen about 10 years ago but you just see his life spiraling downwards and it's pretty scary actually um to see that happening to someone um but it's like you can't force the pattern to change into the upward trajectory. The person has to find that for themselves. Um, so, yes, I definitely changed the pattern there of over helping, I guess, or feeling like I could do something about the, you know, <laughs> the arrogance of it. <laughs> that I should be able to change this. 
that, that was like me. I thought, do I just let him know he's going down the completely wrong path here and this is so old and so, you know, you're not going to get anywhere with what you're doing. And I thought it's not up to me to say that. And that's where the deafness, that's where the 43 came in for me, where my own insight came in to allow him to be deaf to me. It's okay that somebody doesn't listen. It's not nice, but it's okay because they're on their own path as well. Yeah. My, my pattern from my past would just to be yell louder and maybe they'd hear me. <laughs> How are you changing the pattern, Laurie, or are you sticking with it? <laughs> no, I, I have my own shadow stuff coming up and these impulses and urges and I'm just sitting with them and it's like almost in that paralyzation, right? Like just hold on, Laurie, don't act. Just hold on. <laughs> just hold on. Yeah, I love that gift of restraint in Jinky 52. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> okay, well, um, let's have a look at the um, human design chart now and see what's going on with that. Hopefully, I'm going to find it. No, I might need to. Just go and check it's open. Mm -hmm. Ah, here we go. Just shut that. Okay, should be able to open it now. Um, so there's some quite interesting asteroids also involved in this. Um, that I use um, Taraka to have a look at. Um, so here we see um, that this eclipse is happening on the cross of the Sphinx. Um, this cross is about guiding people, guiding yourself first of all, and then guiding people. I love the 13 because that's about deep listening. Um, the one and the two we've already talked about the you know the entropy and the dislocation moving into beauty and unity um yeah so it's a powerful cross this the sphinx um i have it as my cosmic design and uh and I really feel that it's you know shapes my work a lot this this one and uh, if I'm ever in trouble, I always return to listening, the 13. So we're in the 6-4 pattern. So the 6 for me is about holding the dream, holding the big vision. And the line 4 is about the heart opening, the connection through the community. Um, so here we can see Venus is in the 43 line 3. And in design, she's in the 56 line four, which is intoxication. It's one of my favorite gene keys, actually, that, that one. Um, it's got a very kind of sensual nature to it. Um, yeah, and, and so we've also got Saturn there in the 13, um, which is the um, design earth. So Saturn is, is with the purpose, basically. If we looked at this as a, a Gene Keys chart, Saturn would be anchoring the purpose. So that's maybe quite a good way of looking at this. And we've also got uh, Mars in the 12, which is an anchoring Gene Key, a very kind of sort things out on the material plane Gene Key. Um, yeah, so that's a good one to look at as well. Like, how do I need to anchor myself right now? So let's have a look at what's in Gene Key 1. Um, so we've got the Sun, the South Node, Mercury, and we've got Hidalgo. So Hidalgo is like a revolutionary, named after a person, a Spanish revolutionary. So there may be an element we see of, um, you know, people demonstrating or that kind of energy going on. 
Um, we also have a more at the moment in Gene Key One. So he's been there a while. And that's that kind of romantic love coming in. Um, Sirene is one of the mermaids. Um, so I don't know too much about her, but apart from the fact she has that kind of oceanic mermaid consciousness. And then we have um, Poseidon as well. So Poseidon is a Uranian object. These objects, they're not physically there, but um, they've been shown to be very powerful points anyway in the zodiac. Um, Poseidon for me is an interesting one because he, um, he feels like the new octave of, of Neptune. Um, next week, we're going to be doing Medusa, and Neptune rapes Medusa in the sanctuary of the temple. So Neptune is responsible for that anger rage in that Medusa archetype, essentially. Um, and it feels that Poseidon is rewriting the story. So we then also have the, the myth of Poseidon and Celestia, who, who kind of turns Neptune, Poseidon, from the sort of brutish rapist into husband material. And this feels, you know, very connected for me with that um, Juno, Estrella energy, where we're being resensitized, um, and I don't know if any of you have seen the, my octopus teacher um, on Netflix, but this for, for me is what is happening to the male energy as it engages with the divine feminine, who in this case takes the form of the octopus, who is jinky too, actually as well. So. Um, yeah, so that watch that movie if you haven't seen it. It's a documentary and it's so touching. Uh, Typhon is one of the one of the ugly children <laughs> of um, the sort of dragon goddess in the heavens, and I uh, can't remember too much about him, but he might represent that kind of ugly side of ourselves um that that can come up and interestingly he's also in the 43 um in in personality and he's actually in the one in design so there's a connection there with venus um you know, can we learn to love the ugly parts of ourselves and others you know the 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 ugly child within <laughs> what does that look like for us um yeah so so those are the hang on i just wanted to so let's have a look at the um the earth and the moon then so we've got the earth the north node uranus um, and here we have Albion. So you might remember we did um, a class on Albion and the connection with um, the, the British islands and especially Scotland. And we had all kinds of activity going on around Albion as um, Tara was going off to Scotland. I've been really drawn to Scotland this year and that northern kind of goddess crone energy that's very strong there um, and it also took us to like the healing of the witch hunts that started in Scotland um, and spread through the United Kingdom and then kind of you know went global basically where nine million women were killed so Albion is is offering us this opportunity of healing for this very profound wound in the collective consciousness. Um, we have Artemis, so she keeps appearing as well. You know, she's a very maiden archetype with the arrow. She's like the wild girl of nature. Um, and it feels like she has some sexual wounding as well. So 
you know, can can Artemis kind of not not um, sort of set her dogs on the, the the man who fancied her and rip him to shreds? You know, <laughs> could she deal with that in some different way now if we change that story? Um, and then we also have Arnica, and I love Arnica because, you know, like almost so many households on the planet have this plant medicine. We all kind of use it for shock. And if we don't use it for shock, we should, because it's such a powerful remedy. Um, but it feels like Arnica being in this mix um, and Uranus is a shocking planet, you know, it can unlock what has been shocking, like traumas and stuff like that. So it feels really nice to me that that Arnica is, is kind of involved in, in that. Okay, so I come out of that. And um, yeah, so do any of those uh, archetypes kind of call to you? want to know more about any of them um i'd love to hear your if any of them have been popping up for you lately artemis seems to be one that's <laughs> doing the rounds with people um i'm quite interested in typhon as well the ugly child in in all of us like the ugly duckling almost that's what i'm feeling into there Does anyone else watch my octopus teacher? I just watched yeah, it. I just love it. Time. It was amazing. Yeah. So what, what did you think, Kristen, about the kind of resensitization of the male? Did you kind of perceive that in the documentary? Yeah, I just saw it. I didn't think of it that way. I thought of it just as this um, balanced energy that was had the strength. I mean, because he was, you know, so like physically, you know, I, I kept looking at him. I was like, wow, he's like, a, you know. Um, yeah, just, you know. His physical his physical body just kept you know standing out to me as strength but then just his heart and you know this emotional connection to this octopus and so i just saw this fluidity of this balanced energy and i it's interesting i didn't think of it as masculine and feminine i just saw it as um yeah as it should be you know as it should be and then you know teaching his son the and his son being really interested and um yeah curious so i i i just love that about it i just loved it and then also the you know not wanting to protect her because you know if, if it was a feminine you know we would have been like taking her home right <laughs> so um so i thought that was interesting how he just you know as much as he wanted to protect her and as much as he wanted to um you know keep the predators away he just really allowed um nature to kind of take its course so i thought that was really interesting too so yeah it was beautiful i watched it on the flight home so i just watched it a, like a few days ago what did you think sasha from that point of view of of this transformation of siadin
I, I really like the, the that show as well from the perspective of his ability to just tune into that animal and then seeing seeing them connect right it reminds me a lot of my relationship with my cat who's part dog I'm pretty sure but it just right and just how even my cat he'll put his paw out to touch me right like just that connection between nature and human is very powerful the company is powerful Yeah, there's that one bit when she puts her tentacle on his heart and it's just like, oh my God, you could just melt, you know, like the tears. <laughs> yeah, that, that documentary was life-changing for me. I remember when it first came out. I'll have to watch it again. Um, I was wondering exactly where Scorpio, where it's happening, the, the eclipse. I'll just show you, oh, I've closed, I've closed the thing now, but so um, the sun is at 16 degrees Scorpio. 16 degrees. And the moon is at 16 degrees Taurus with um, Uranus is conjunct the moon. So that is on the gene key one and two access so the pure yin and the pure yang um so it's it is it's a very powerful portal actually into our our prime genetics because in the i ching the one the two the 63 and the 64 are the codons from which all the other gene keys emanate so it's it's almost like the the possibility of a reset of some important energies um so offering you that for your next uh, amazing yoga set <laughs> i'm actually i'm actually teaching a, an eclipse set this morning and tomorrow because um that's what wanted to happen so yeah i saw that i'm like yeah <laughs> So yeah, that's that's going on, and you keep I, I keep hearing the the keywords kind of popping up in your, your nomenclature around shock. So it's funny that the meditation is actually for shock, um, because I was just kind of looking at it, and it looked like there was a lot of unexpected energies that are yeah. arising around it, and then of course falling right on the election year. So um, I, I've just been noticing really that the guys in my life like the the male the males in general seem to be struggling a little bit more lately with the energy so you know i it's nice hearing you say that because so much of my energy has been moving in that direction just kind of supporting um my husband supporting a couple of male students um my son so yeah I just come up underneath the guys. They need it right now. Seems to be a lot transforming for them. And of course, uh, I think Kristen, you know this very deeply. I, th I think it's quite useful with that Astraea Juno thing to actually have like a focus of allowing the male energy to resensitize. So not creating narratives where the male has to put on their kind of alpha armor has to rescue the female um all these uh, kind of um things that we play out you know can can we just um create space for men to feel um to be embodied you know, just to be themselves rather than what the overculture has told them they have to be, which are very powerful narratives, you know, people feel like they failed if they're not achieving them. So, um, so that resensitization piece, I think, can, it helps me anyway, respond, I think, in a, 
the best way in the moment. And sometimes that is just stillness. You know, I love that you said that, Cynthia, you know, sometimes just being still and silent actually allows things to shift on their own, in their own way towards, you know, our evolution. The energy knows where it wants to go. <laughs> so in a way, we just got to get out the way, you know, and support it. I also feel that like my husband is the 63, 64 and I'm the one and two. So we have the two bookends for, for the whole lot. And um, a lot of it in that with, you know, resilience or in that silence and sitting in is maybe asking them to explain what they mean, because a lot of the time we tend to be in our heads and think what they're thinking, but we don't know what they're thinking and vice versa. And, and the same way vice versa. And so getting stuck in those patterns of getting annoyed with each other, I, I tend to now ask, well, can you explain or can you expand on that a little bit more so that I have more of a more of an insight as to what they're wanting to say rather than what I think they're wanting to say. So there's a lot of that as well, of, of the, that 13 coming in and just listening, like you were saying earlier, and allowing and, and asking the questions rather than assuming what's coming down the tracks, because that that just leads right back into the same old hamster wheel. So, yeah, it's, it's been quite a week. <laughs> yeah, well, it might just be getting started. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to intensify. The next few days are going to be quite intense, really. So I'm just going to hang on in there. <laughs> See. I think try and bring some playfulness into it. Mm. A little bit of playfulness and a little bit of sensuality rather than sexuality. And mm. um, that really is helping me going forward. We're together 26 years and, you know, 1.3 is my evolution. But he would tell you if he sat here now, our relationship always seems to be fresh and new. And that's because I never I never go by yesterday. It's always in the moment or or tomorrow. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's coming down the tracks as well. A bit of playfulness and a bit of sensuality. Hi, everybody. That is me, Danny. It's funny listening to this because um, with me, it's me putting up firmer boundaries. Um, two situations have happened, um, one with teaching a group of men, and it felt like there was some disrespect going on, just people, they're not focusing on the class, and I actually stopped, got up, and spoke, and now at the beginning of each uh, class, I lay down agreements and I say, okay, these are agreements that we have showing respect for me, respect for each other, um, no phones. And it's just funny because um, everybody responded and they're just a lot more <laughs> perceptive and helpful. And I guess I needed to step into that space. I felt like the school mistress though, like with uh you know a stick being <laughs> really firm but now that we've created that space everything just um it feels like uh it feels like it's shifted now and we feel like we're more together the other thing is with that child um uh see, holding the ugliness i have a nine-year-old and my child is, um, he's a very spirited um, child and, you know, Gobi can just be intense. He's an intense kid and, you know, he's got this face that, you know, will charm you to pieces, but uh, he can be, he can be challenging and, um, 
even when he's being challenging, still keeping that energy of love um, within me. And what's funny is the gene keys being on the Delta has actually really helped me a lot because I'm really listening to what is my mental field right now. Like, what am I really thinking while this is going on? And so um, really bringing that energy of peace more. And it's been completely transformational because I'm really um, in a place of responsibility for what's going on beneath um, beneath the surface. And he can feel that because he's a child. And also, once again, setting a boundary. I, I took away the iPad, phone, like I took away all electronics. So it's just funny for me, it's holding these boundaries that's bringing in a, a better relationship. So thank you. <laughs> if Cynthia reminded me actually using that word sensuality of another theme that's come up this week. Um, that I, uh, when I was on the Isle of Lewis at Same, we did a crone reading and mine was so good. It was sovereignty. So like the priestess with a flowering rod. Um, then it was potentiality and there was like the Milky Way and the stars. Um, and oh no, that wasn't where it came out. And then the third one was home, but it wasn't there. I had this kinesiology session with my friend. And so it was talking about, a, I'm in a gateway at the moment. And what I'm walking out of is, it used the word limitation and entrapment. And I'm going into kind of spiritual growth. Um, so that entrapment word kind of kind of caught my attention, because if you have a line five in your tractor field, that's that entrapment. You know, how do I entrap people and how do they entrap me? And one of the big things I've kind of been really seeing this week is how um, kind of I get drawn in as, as a kind of rescuer, a carer. You know, I kind of ended up in my last relationship being a carer for nine years to someone. I'm like, oh, my God, how did that just happen? <laughs> you know, but I have such a strong sense of kind of duty and caring. It's very hard to say I'm not going to do it. <laughs> you know? um, and then kind of seeing my friend last night and, and realizing I was being given the choice. Am I going to get hooked into rescuing this person or am I going to live my life and trust that he will find his way out of what he needs to do? Um, so that whole kind of victim, you know, the victimization story, I think, is something that's really being challenged by this eclipse, us to reset that. Um, you know, um, allow people to sort their own shit out <laughs> and we sort our shit out and then everything will go much more smoothly than we get hooked into these kind of things and then we're sort of compromised and, you know, we lose power, we lose energy. Um, it's a fine line because we have to look after people as well. So, you know, how we have to look after children and we have to look after the old, the, the people who are sick, but how do we kind of get a balance on that? I guess come from a good place rather than an entrapped place. <laughs> so any last things we've only got a couple of minutes left let's see a baby head has appeared hello little sweet one she loves your voice allison <laughs> i was hoping pretty. i could introduce you all to my grandson but he's sleeping oh, oh. is he so we've got two 
two babies yeah. in the field. <laughs> yeah. New beginnings. <laughs> Such fun. Yeah. <laughs> I love babies. <laughs> Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a very pleasant evening for me <laughs> being here. And um, yes, yeah, so I'll see you. So next Monday, we're going to do Medusa. Um, she's quite a very dark goddess. Um, so she should be a fun one to do. Hello, Daniela. <laughs> Want to say anything before we go? It's been really lovely to listen. And it's funny, I was, um, you know, I've been in this beautiful um, lovership relationship with this very alpha man. And we were together last night for a very long, long time. And I, I woke up this morning thinking, huh, he was, it, he was so soft. There was not even an ounce of challenging or contrarian there was, i was it was remarkable and i was i was, I was, I was saying, <laughs> such, you know it was so amazing and i not that it, i mean i enjoyed this too but it was really special that there wasn't anything like that going on yeah no i'm seeing in this relationship i'm in like a real shift in the mail from the last time i engaged with one <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like wow this is amazing you know none of this old crap playing out but it could play out if we weren't kind of mindful but just a bit of mindfulness goes a long way i think so anyway it's lovely to see everybody and uh i'll see you all next week Bye. Thanks, Allison. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.